So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this, the eighth uh, FND Awareness Day UK, uh, in collaboration between FND Action, FND Friends and FND Dimensions. Uh, we've got three events today with nearly a thousand bookings across the three events. Uh, obviously, we don't expect everybody to turn up, uh, with FND being as it is. Um, we ask you to stay on mute um, um, during the presentations. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat. Uh, if you move your cursor around or if you're on a phone or whatever, at the bottom of the screen or top, depending where the bar is, um, you'll see a ch chat button. Um, and there's also a reactions button as well, where you can raise your hand uh, if you want to ask a question, but that will be after Steph's presentation. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll shut up and I will uh, pass over to um, Steph and um, uh, welcome Steph and thank you for doing the first presentation this year. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I hope you can all hear me okay and see the slides. There's nothing particular you need to see on the slides. Um, it's mostly just for my memory instead, if I'm honest. Um, so thank you. It's amazing to see so many people here today. And um, thank a special thank you to our hosts. So that's FND Action, FND Friends and FND Dimensions. And a special thank you to um, Kim, Mandy and Steve, who I know have collaborated um, over a number of years now for FND Awareness Day. Um, I think it's really beautiful when we bring together our community in this way. So huge thank you and a thank you for having me as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, this is me. I'm Steph. Um, as Steve mentioned, I have a number of different titles, um, but I'm in neuropsychology. I'm a mixed methods researcher and a neuroimaging specialist. I'm currently a lecturer at Bishop Grosseteste University, um, and I'm a PhD and guest lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. I'm also a member of various different organisations, um, including the BPS Division of Neuropsychology. In terms of my outreach work, I think a lot of people by now will have seen my TED talk. If not, I'm sure we can pop the link in the chat at some point. Um, it's available to watch on YouTube and I've got plans for other outreach work. Um, I've been a patient support worker um, or involved in the community in some way for about 10 years now. Um, it'll be actually my 10th year in April. Um, and I'm currently the vice chair and um, medical advisory board lead at FND Dimensions. In terms of my research, I'm considered to be an FND specialist. I've been researching this topic now since about 2015, so since my undergraduate. Um, and that kind of stemmed from my own lived experience. I am a patient as well. I was diagnosed at 14. Um, and I've certainly come a long way since then, but I think my own lived experience of the condition is what drove me into this um, area of research in the first place. Um, I'm currently trying to submit my PhD on FND, uh, which is due in about four weeks or so. Um, and I don't know what my next steps are yet, but I'm looking forward to finding out what they are. And they're definitely still gonna be along the lines of FND. I'm gonna continue to work in this area. So there's a little bit about me just so that you know who I am um, and the, you know what I do, I guess. Um, so when I... Um, was asked to give this talk today, I was asked to give it on the theme of then and now, which is the theme of this year's Awareness Day. Um, and the history of, of FND is, as we all know, kind of rocky. Um, research itself always sits in this social political sphere, wh whatever discipline we're in, it's all informed by the norms of the time, um, the values of the time, regardless of the field. And it gets heavily influenced by our perceptions of things at any given time. Um, so the history of FND, without going into too much detail, is also kind of the history of research. And I know that um, FND Portal in his talk later on today will be going through some of that. So I definitely won't cross over too much into that territory. Um, but the earliest kind of research into FND, or at least the most well documented case, early case of FND, was the case of Anna O. Um, and this was a case that um, Freud worked on. Um, when you read the kind of case history of Anna O, oh, it's very reminiscent of what we would think um, of FND now. You know, Anna O oh suffered from um, some forms of paralysis. She easily entered this state of hypohypnosis, auto hypnosis as well. 
Um, and a lot of this then led to this idea of talking therapies um, and this idea of FND being simply conversion disorder, that Anna Ive had experienced some trauma and had repressed that trauma and it was um, being exerted in all these kind of bodily symptoms. Um, it led to a long line of research for a long time, just focusing on this idea of linking FND to trauma. Um, and we'll come back to this idea in contemporary research to see how we view that now. Um, yeah, around the same time, we had kind of a um, scientific revolution and this idea of um, science influencing um, our understanding of conditions and how we study them. So the earliest EEGs, if you don't know what an EEG is, it's an electroencephalogram. It's the kind of cap on the head thing. And some people may have had this if they've gone to the hospital for tests for epilepsy, for example. Um, but the EEG was actually invented in Germany um, in around 1924-ish. Um, the first EEGs that were applied to patient groups were actually in 1935. Um, and it was a three hertz system that was used back then. Um, and they were able to detect epilepsy spikes on EEG. Um, but uh, just to give you some context, our contemporary EEGs, modern EEGs, measure things up to 256 hertz. Um, so we can now look at things in an awful lot more detail than we could previously. Um, even other forms of neuroimaging, so things like MRI and fMRI, um, came much later. It was around 1974 that things like MRI was, was first done on humans, and the first study was actually just to look at someone's finger um, in 1974. So our neurological advancement, and at least the, the current technologies that we're using to study FND, are relatively modern. Um, it's only about sort of the late 1990s and early 2000s that these methods have started to be applied to FND. Uh, when I entered research in kind of the early 2000s, what I saw in uh, those kind of early research steps around, around the early 2000s and the back end of the 1990s was that these um, neuroimaging technologies, we didn't really know how to apply them to FND. Um, there was still that longstanding issue of trauma to deal with, and there was two kind of main lines of argument um, around FND at this time. So there was either the idea that FND was a result of repressed trauma um, or that it was fascinating, um, which also really irritated me as someone who was that living is. with the condition. I didn't find it a fascinating thing at all. And I understand now that, you know, it is helping us to okay. understand more and more about things like consciousness, about movement disorders in general. Um, but the research into okay. FND wasn't that dedicated. I um, there was also a lot of research at this time that was actually looking at if FND um, symptoms were being faked, um, which, again, angered me as a researcher with that lived experience of the condition. And I'm not going to drop any names into this. Um, certainly, they published and found that there was no evidence that those with FND were faking their symptoms, thankfully. So we're really glad they published. Um but it did kind of derail a lot of our understanding of FND because people were just trying to see if patients were faking it or not, or if they had trauma or not. Our contemporary understandings of FND have evolved so much. So um, as of uh, since 2001, there have been 2000, 1000, sorry, 1,210 peer-reviewed pieces on FND alone. Beautiful. And that's not a lot when we compare it to other conditions and disorders, but it's certainly a lot more than we've had before. Um, our research now looks at quite a few different lines. Um, so we're still trying to understand exactly what is going on, what the causes of FND are, and how that implicates things like neural networks. Um, in FND. And there's other lines of research that are looking more along the treatment routes um, or what we can do to improve awareness, what we can do to improve clinical outcomes, what we can do in terms of treatment. And it's obviously quite hard to understand what we can do in terms of treatment when we still have such a limited understanding of what is going on in FND. That's not to say that we haven't found some answers and hopefully I'll be able to share some of those with you today.
Um, so when I was approaching um, the research angle in terms of our contemporary understandings, I didn't really know how to broach this because there is an awful lot that I could cover. Um, as a neuropsychologist, I don't just look at brain stuff. I look at the psychology stuff as well. So I do look at um, things like cognition and consciousness. I do look at movement um, cognition. I look at how the brain interacts with the body, how our behaviors, thoughts and feelings are all part of that. So my research kind of stems across the field of FND and I didn't want to try and cover everything in one go. So I thought instead what I'd try and do is um, try and tackle some of the myths that there are around FND um, and around FND research in particular. So I went out to my socials and asked people what they wanted me to cover in the talk and then tried to identify where some of those myths were and thought that I'd um, start by tackling some of those. One of the biggest myths I hear about FND is that FND doesn't show up on a brain scan. Um, and it's true to some extent, but not entirely. Um, so in order to break this down a little bit, we need an understanding of exactly how the brain works. We used to think of the brain like this. We used to think that um, the brain worked with dedicated structures depending upon um, whatever principle we were looking at. So researchers previously thought that um, there was a part of the brain that was to do with our moral sense of self. There was a part of the brain to do with our artistic abilities. There was a part of the brain to do with our mathematical abilities. And um, that continued to advance. So even as we understood things like the amygdala um, and the hippocampus and all these other brain structures, we still thought that functions were dedicated to those structures alone. But now we know that brain structure isn't just about those individual parts. Instead, they operate in networks. Um, these activate, they communicate. So different areas of the brain, even if they're not close together, communicate in these mathematical networks. It's really coordinated. It's quite a stable thing between individuals. So we've been able to map these out quite a lot. Um, and these network patterns are really important. They're important for things like neuroplasticity, which is our brain's way of healing itself and changing the way that it functions. They're really important for things like resilience. So resilience to adverse experiences. And they're really important in terms of efficiency. This is how the brain is able to process so much and do so much in such a, a quick um, fire succession. Um, but the brain's capable of changing these patterns. It's capable of changing the math that governs the connectivity between those different structures. And if we experience something that's maladaptive, if we experience something that's bad for the brain, then that's going to change the way that these structures function. And it's going to disrupt our neural connectivity between those different brain areas. Um, so FND, because of that, is considered to be a neural network disorder. There's been a lot of findings around this. So there's disruptions to multiple brain networks, and that includes salience and motor limbic control. Um, there's also a lot of studies that have implicated the right temporal parietal junction, or the RTPJ, um, and networks that are based around the RTPJ. And um, those are seen to be quite dysfunctional in FND. So that influences things like our sense of self, our sense of self-agency, um, and leads to self-agency disruptions. It leads to things like reduced connectivity with sensory motor regions. And in some studies, they've found that there's hypoactivation, which is linked to involuntary movements in FND. So things like tics, things like convulsions, and even possibly seizures. Um, but that's not entirely the whole story when it comes to brain networks. Um, even in resting state um, conditions, so all of those findings are when we're initiating a task and then measuring the brain's response to that task. But actually more recent findings have found that even when the brain is just resting, when we're doing There's a lot of studies that have linked things like motor networks and for things like differences.
Okay, we seem to have had a snag there. Um, I'm not sure where Steph's gone. Are you still there, Steph? You now, what happened? Oh, he's <laughs> back. Right, I'll let you carry on. I've just got to reshare my screen now, haven't I? Yeah. Um, apologies, I don't know where I went there. It just suddenly disappeared and I went, oh, where is everyone? Um, where am I? Oh. I think you're on slide seven. Ooh, I can't oh, see my thing to... Well, something was going to happen today, wasn't it? <laughs> oh. It resumes slide slow. Oh, hello. <laughs> Bear with me. It's not letting me reshare. Right, perhaps if you turn your camera off. Yeah. Um, that might boost your signal. Sorry, folks. Technical glitch. Joys Just of it. IT. Just while Steph's doing that, remember, if anyone's got any questions, if they want to add them to the chat, uh, then please do, and then we'll we'll come to those at the end. Um, there we go, hopefully. Bingo. Okay, I'm just going to flip forward. Apologies. Thanks, Steph. Okay. Okay, I really don't know what happened there, but hopefully it doesn't happen again. Um. So... One of the other things that we need to consider is that um, there's differences between different symptoms and how these appear in terms of these neural networks as well. So um, very often with neuroimaging studies, what we've done is we've grouped together um, anyone with FND, regardless of their symptom in our studies. And it's very difficult to compare someone who has tics and seizures to someone who has motor difficulties. And some of the findings are suggesting that there may be different brain networks that are impacted that kind of result in those different symptoms. But that research is in its really early stages. We don't have those categories predefined and we don't really know um, yet exactly what those differences might be. So that's one of the future directions of research and something that we're currently working on. Um, the other thing to remember is that even though we're doing lots of things around the brain and lots of things to understand these different brain networks, the brain doesn't sit in isolation. The brain is connected to the mind, is connected to the rest of the body. Um, and there's certainly more to research than just understanding dysfunctional brain networks. So there's an awful lot of upcoming research that's really exciting um, and that's telling us more and more about FND. So the next myth um, that I wanted to kind of break um, is this one. It's just a trauma response. Um, one, even if this was just a trauma response, I don't think that means it deserves any less attention. That's my first argument. Um, my second argument is that I've met an awful lot of people with this condition um, and been in this research game for a long time. And I think that trauma represents a subgroup of people. We need to remember that trauma impacts the brain in much the same way that infection does, head injury does, inflammation does, um, and all of these other things that we know can trigger FND. Brain patterns and brain networks can become easily disrupted by a whole range of adverse events. Um, so while some researchers have found that there's higher rates of trauma in an FND population, I'm one of the researchers that hasn't found this connection. Um, I haven't been able to establish very clearly that that is the main risk factor, for example, and I think it's just one of many things that we need to consider. One of the other areas um, that's kind of related to this that we need to consider is the role of dissociation. Um, and dissociation is one of my research specialisms. So dissociation is this separation of um, processes that are normally integrated quite well. And for a long time, dissociation has been viewed as being a, a product of trauma. Um, so when we go through a traumatic event, we're said to disassociate to protect ourselves. 
But um, dissociation can happen for a wide range of reasons in much the same way that FND does. Trauma is just one of those reasons. Dissociation has many different types. Um, so there's dissociation of the self, there's dissociation from our environment, there's dissociation from time, place, space. Um, all of those processes can be kind of disrupted in, in someone who's got higher dissociation. And that's one of the areas of research that I've been particularly focused on now for a number of years. Um, and I'll certainly bring that up probably again. <laughs> Um, another myth that I've heard about FND research is that there's no role for psychology. And I'm going to be a little bit biased in my response to this because I am predominantly a psychologist. Um, but psychology is hugely misunderstood as well. It goes beyond just counselling and talking therapies. We are research experts. Um, so we look at um, FND from a wide range of uh, different backgrounds and we do contribute quite a bit to understanding FND. I think there's a big role for psychology moving forward that psychologists perhaps haven't really been as invested in as they should be. Don't get me wrong, I know that psychology's added some bits that we don't want to keep going back over and keep discussing, um, but not all of us are fixed to the DSM. Not all of us are um, just focused on understanding things from a talking background. There's a lot of techniques that we use that come out of psychology and different disciplines in psychology. So different neuropsychological techniques can help us to manage our energy levels and have less impact on our overall symptoms. Um, things like grounding techniques and pacing techniques are all ways that we can try and manage our symptoms a little bit better. And all of those come from psychology. Um, another kind of myth that also gets thrown at me an awful lot is that FND is simply X condition, state your condition there, rebranded. So very often people will say it's just ME rebranded um, or it's just this other condition rebranded. Re what we know from research is that FND is a distinct condition. Um, a lot of my research around EEG shows that I can distinguish now um, between a patient brain scan um, and a, a healthy control um, brain scan. But we've also started to use a lot of other control groups in our research so that we can say this isn't just a product of being ill for a long time. It's also a product of it, it solely because of FND. So we might do comparisons if we're looking at functional seizures, we might do comparisons to an epilepsy group. If we're looking at movement dysfunction, we might do comparisons to um, a healthy group and a group of people who have MS or Parkinson's. Um, whilst it's been assumed that there's this general mechanism that operates amongst all FNDs, a lot of my research currently is trying to identify these subtypes um, and talk about um, looking at research slightly differently and looking at these subtypes of FND um, as well as that kind of general underlying mechanism. And I'm not going to talk too much about my findings because um, I need to write them up and publish them. So I'm not going to speak about them too, too in depth. Right, quick, um, we also know that comorbidity is really high in FND. So um, there's really high rates of other neurological conditions as well as things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome slash ME, um, EDS, migraines and others. <laughs> it's also been found to be um, a high crossover between ASD and FND. Um, and really recent research as of like 2022 is coming out to suggest that those rates are higher in FND. We don't know why there's such a crossover with these other conditions, but our next step is to understand these more, um, to understand how these might influence treatment um, and understand how these different combinations of symptoms might influence how symptoms are displayed in the first place. Um, something else that someone mentioned is no one's talking about stigma. And this is kind of a new emerging line of research. We do recognize that those with FND experience an awful lot of stigma. Um, and this can really influence and limit their access to healthcare, as well as just in general understanding of, of FND. It can also limit things like online awareness um, and awareness raising. I'm sure if you are quite proactive online and talking about FND, you will have come across this. Um, just to point out, a lot of us get um, 
targeted and stigmatized for our online activities and researchers and clinicians do experience it as well. Um, so there is certainly emerging lines of research to show and highlight um, the importance of talking about stigma um, and, and the impacts that that has for those with FND. Um, one final um, myth buster then, um, and this one does grate on me a little bit, it's just a women's problem. We do know that um, from our epidemiological studies that it is diagnosed more in women than in men. It's a, about a ratio of three women to every one male. However, um, there's a lot of conditions where this is also true. There's higher rates for a lot of neurological and psychological illnesses uh, that impact women more than men. And in all honesty, we don't still know why that is the case. There's also perhaps a historical bias here leading to increased um, rates of diagnosis in women. Men who display symptoms are sometimes diagnosed with PTSD instead of FND. Um, I also think it's really important that when we're saying it's a woman's issue, we shouldn't dismiss that at all. Um, I don't think that just because something is a women's issue that everyone shouldn't be talking about it. We absolutely should. But I also think that really undermines men's experiences of living with FND. So I think if we start branding things as being for a particular gender, it really limits other people's experiences that don't fit into that mold. Um, if this was a women's problem, I'd also like to point out there's a real lack of research in female specific um, understandings. So things like the impact of FND in childbirth, um, the impact of pregnancy on FND, and um, things like perimenopausal or menstruation cycles, and if they influence symptoms. Um, there's other epidemiological studies that have suggested that there's a link between socioeconomic status and FND. And again, I think we need to be really careful with understanding these kind of findings. Um, they've been taken too literally in the past. And um, I think there's some really sensitive lines that we need to tread here. Um, socioeconomic status affects health outcomes in an awful lot of ways. And it doesn't just mean um, that you're more likely to develop FND. There's an awful lot more going on here um, than simply how much money we make. Um, we also need even more work in this area. So there's other groups that have not been considered in research in the same way uh, that they have been for other health conditions. Um, so one of the things that I'm quite looking forward to in future research is getting involved in really large scale epidemiological studies to understand more risk factors for FND. There's lots of other research avenues that I've not really talked about in too much detail. So currently we are trying to understand the causes and the mechanisms, understand those risk factors, um, understanding the lived experience of those um, that are diagnosed with FND and understanding a whole range of biomarkers. There's a lot of research going into improving clinical outcomes. So improvements to diagnosis, to the experience of getting a diagnosis and how that should look, how that influences our experiences in healthcare, um, and how we can categorize or better understand categories of FND to improve care provision and improve different outcomes as well. And mm -hmm. there's some research into possible treatments of FND, but we do need to consider the impact of different symptoms. We haven't really done a lot of longitudinal studies to understand the impact of those treatments over a longer period of time. Um, and we can't really understand treatments until we've understood the causes as well. Um, so there's awful, there's an awful lot of research that still needs to go into that. Um, someone or quite a few people said to me, well, what does this mean? You know, all of this research into FND, what does this actually mean for me? How can I utilize that research in my own illness journey um, in improving my own symptoms and outcome? So I could sit here and tell you, you know, researchers have found that the right temporoparietal region isn't properly connected. Um, but you can't just dip your hand into your brain and change that wiring yourself. And, and rewire it so that it works correctly. Um, there are ways that we can change the neural networks. Um, 
there's things <sighs> like EMDR, there's other therapies, there's neurofeedback. All of these are treatments and techniques that we can utilize. But I'd like to stress that um, treatments need to be individual. Not everyone with the same set of symptoms will show the same outcomes with the same set of treatment. So two people with the same set of symptoms can go through EMDR. One person really gets on with EMDR and finds that it improves their symptoms. But someone else who has the same set of symptoms might not have that. Um, for me, it comes back to brain health. Um, and understanding the things that are good for our health are also really good for our brain. Um, we should use our symptoms as a guide to understand what may be going wrong for us, what networks may be disrupted, um, and how we can then apply that to a collaborative approach with a healthcare professional um, in deciding our treatment and our outcomes. Um, there's also things like dissociation, which I've mentioned, um, and doing things like mindfulness and pacing um, can really help and grounding techniques can really help to reduce those symptoms of dissociation and improve long term outcomes for FND. Um, OK, my current work, um, there's a lot going on. I've mentioned that I'm about four weeks or so away from submitting my PhD. And my current PhD has explored things like inflammation, dissociation, and brain function in FND. We've also done some additional work to look at symptom profiles and then look at how groups of symptoms could be clustered, um, how it statistically makes sense to cluster them, and how they may be different in terms of their brain function, in terms of inflammatory levels, um, and biomarkers that tell us about inflammation and things like dissociation. Um, Along the way, because the pandemic hit my PhD quite hard, um, I have done a lot of other research as well, which I'm hoping will be published as soon as I've gotten the PhD out of the way. Um, so things like applying AI techniques to EEG data to understand more about the patterns of neural connectivity in FND. Um, I've done an awful lot of work around motor cognition um, in functional movement disorder. There's a lot of other EEG work and neuroimaging work um, some of which I need to finish off. Um, and there's other inflammatory markers that we're hoping to understand as well. Um, a kind of sideline is um, multimodal analysis of imagery um, and qualitative pieces as well, all of which are half started and not quite finished. So I have an awful lot of things under my belt that are nearly ready to go. Um, and some really interesting findings that have come out of my PhD, which I'm hoping to be able to share a lot more widely soon. Um, so where do I think the future of research into FND is going? I think there's an awful lot of things that we should be doing um, that we're not quite doing. And things like patient participatory research. So involving patients into the research process, involving the community that we're actually re doing research about. I think that patients for a long time in a lot of health conditions, not just FND, um, haven't really had a voice and the patient insight for me drives my research forward. So I'd certainly like to see more patient participatory research. I'd like to see much more neuroimaging research um, on different clusters or different types of symptoms. So whether that's functional seizures or functional cognitive disorders or functional movement disorders. I'd like to see um, greater inclusion of more control groups. So for a long time, we've just compared those with FND to healthy participants. Um, if you've ever been involved in any of my studies, you know I have multiple groups most of the time to compare my research against different groups to see if those results are specific to FND or more general about the symptoms. Um, we need more longitudinal studies. So we need to follow people through the research process and see how symptoms change over a number of years. Um, we need to do more multi multimodal research. So by this, I mean combining different research elements together to give us this bigger picture, this more holistic picture of what's potentially happening in FND. Um, larger sample sizes are definitely needed. So whenever you see us sharing about research, please do get involved, please do share the studies because it's only with um, participation from the community that we can actually get these really large samples and get more meaningful data as a result. I'm hoping that there will be much more biomarker research. Um, so in particular, I've um, 
trained in phlebotomy just so that I can measure particular biomarkers in the blood. Um, and the hope would be that one day people could go to the doctors and have a few simple tests um, to be able to get a diagnosis of FND more effectively, more efficiently, and with that uh, clinical understanding and basis. And I want to see more collaboration. Um, a lot of the time, researchers just sit in isolation. We do our studies um, in groups and teams, but very often those teams don't join up and we don't really understand things from like this holistic, multidisciplinary perspective. So certainly want to see more and more collaboration as we move forward, which is starting to happen now. And I think that's it. Um, I've put a kind of end slide on there with links to all my socials. So you can follow me for research updates if you choose to. And a huge thank you to the host again for bringing us all together for Awareness Day. If anyone's got any questions, I don't know, I can't see the chat. So if anyone's, if anyone's got eyes on the chat and wants to throw some questions my way, feel free to. Well, that was great. Thanks, Steph. Uh, I don't know if you want to leave your slide up for a minute, just so people can get your details down. Um, I'm just going back over the chat. One of the first questions that came in was uh, from Tanya. Has the prevalence of being a highly sensitive person, HSP, been included in research with FND? There was certainly for a while this line of argument about um, we were seeing increased rates of healthcare workers in particular who are really empathetic people. Um, getting diagnosed with FND and there is a potential link with um, burnout so emotional burnout or work burnout um, triggering FND but I think again it's one risk factor of potentially many um, and we don't know how much that might contribute to um, to developing FND so it's certainly one aspect that um, people are trying to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, next one is from Lucy. How do we find out about upcoming research studies and if we want to volunteer to take part? Um, good question. A lot of the um, organisations, so FND Action, Dimensions and Friends, all share research studies. Um, I know particularly at Dimensions, I um, do screen them and check that they have things like ethical um, approval from their governing bodies before we share them, just to make sure that all the research studies that we share are ethical um, and do meet our, our um, kind of visions as well. Um, so hopefully they will be shared throughout the community groups. Um, I certainly share an awful lot of research studies, not just my own, on my socials as well. Right, thank you. Um, there's been a couple of comments about uh, some of the acronyms you use and people struggling with those. Is there a good place to... Um, Go and look at what those acronyms mean and what and where you know what what they actually stand for, etc. Yeah, um, I can certainly post like a, a breakdown of those. Apologies, I use acronyms all the time um, in my work, and just to make there be a slightly less on the screen, um, so I can certainly share a breakdown for those acronyms so that we can post that in the comments um, from the recordings. Right, thank you. Uh, just run it down. Uh, There was a question about your PhD paper and where will that be published and if it's possible to get a hold of it? As soon as I've written it, absolutely. Um, so at the moment, I'm very frantically uh, trying to write the remaining chapters. It will be available from uh, Nottingham Trent University's IREP server, which is available online and it will be open access so anyone can download it. Um, I have already got a few published papers out there. So if you do have... Um, access to Google Scholar. If you go to um, scholar.google um, and type in SR Blanco, you'll see a profile with all of my research papers on there. A lot of them are open access, so you should be able to get access to them. Great, thank you. Um, next one. Uh, do you personally think that CBT is helpful for FND patients? I think every therapy has a role for someone. Um, and I'm not going to discredit sort of a whole discipline, um, especially because I'm being recorded. Um, but I do think that CBT is really good for teaching us about certain techniques um, that can be really beneficial. 
I don't know if it's entirely for everyone with FND. Um, I've certainly been through a number of different treatments in my FND journey and didn't find CBT helpful. But then I also think that I wasn't given access to the amount of time that I needed. Um, one of the problems with um, treatment in FND is that we're often limited on the time that we can spend in any one type of therapy. So 10 sessions of CBT might not be enough. However, if we had 20 sessions or 30 sessions, perhaps that would be better. Um, so I think really it depends on the individual. I think CBT certainly has its place, but I think there's a whole range of different treatments that have their place too. And I think that changes throughout your illness journey. Okay, I think that kind of ties into the next question, which was about uh, that you've mentioned treatments and are we looking at management or cure? As of yet, we're quite far away from a cure. Um, so when I'm talking about treatments, I'm talking about anything that um, reduces and lessens the symptoms. Um, I, even though uh, people will consider me cured from FND, I certainly still have a lot of lingering symptoms and I was diagnosed 16 years or so ago now. So I think it's about getting to your um, best possible outcome. And um, sometimes that does mean accepting that there will be sort of a lingering thing or that we constantly need to maintain a certain level. Um, but as of yet, we're a little bit far away from a cure because we don't understand yet exactly what's causing the symptoms. Thanks. That's kind of answered a couple of the other questions as well about you know, is it FND reversible, et cetera, and uh, does it improve, does it get worse? It, it's, um, it, it's all of those things, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, and everyone with FND might go through uh, kind of relapses or remissions. One of the other issues with kind of the neuropsych understanding and, and neuroscience is that we've been assuming that these um, networks are dysfunctional all the time as well. Um, but one of the things that I certainly see is this kind of slump crash reaction. Um, so some days we might have really good days and our symptoms aren't really impacting us. And other days we might entirely crash. Um, and we've not understood that in research yet. And we also can't study that very easily. You can't tell someone, uh, come in and have an MRI whilst you're crashing. It's not that easy to kind of do in research practice. Okay, uh, we've, we've got a raised hand, but I'll just go through a couple more questions that were posed earlier first, and in fairness. Uh, can you explain the diagnostic requirements in order to be accurately diagnosed? Um, so I'm hoping that other um, in the other talks later on today, um, this will probably be covered in a lot more detail. Um, certainly as this evening's talk is Professor Stone, who is in clinical practice and can probably divulge that information a lot clearer than I can. Um, there's a whole range of symptoms that are now considered. Um, a psychological stressor was seen as one of being as being one of the key indicators that someone might have FND but that has been downgraded um, in the more recent versions of the DSM in particular. Um, that's not to say that we rely only on the DSM. Um, there's also things like the ICD um, and other kind of frameworks for understanding diagnosis, but I'm pretty sure that Professor Stone will go through more of the positive signs um, of diagnosis in his talk later on this evening. Okay, thanks. Um, Audrey, do you want to come in with your question? If you could unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Steve. Um, Stephanie, I was just wondering, um, you mentioned that you had your symptoms from at the age of 14. Um, I, I had symptoms since childhood. Uh, obviously, in 2016, it became worse. But how does resignation syndrome fit in with FND? How does, sorry, could you repeat that last bit for me? How does... Yeah. How does resignation syndrome fit, uh, fit in with um, FND? You see it a lot with, or there's a documentary with um, uh, refugee, refugee children in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering about the relationship between that and FND. I think there's certainly a lot around um, stresses, traumas, and particularly um, kind of prolonged stress and trauma of any kind. Um, I think that um, a lot of the work at the moment is talking about accepting a diagnosis too. Um, so 
kind of almost not not saying not to fight um for answers and not to fight for treatment um because we absolutely should but some of it comes down to us kind of accepting that this is uh something that we have and then proactively and collaboratively with our healthcare professionals finding ways to overcome those challenges I think some of the kind of more specific things about how is this involved and how is that involved hasn't really been answered by research yet. So it's kind of a vague response from me, but perhaps the best I can manage at the moment. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Elaine, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in with your question? And we'll go back to the uh, ones in the chat. Hello. So my question, oh, hang on. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. My question is, is could F and D be linked to dyspraxia? There's an awful lot of research at the moment that's suggesting there could be links to things like ASD. Um, there's not links yet to things like dyslexia and dyspraxia, which I'm hoping uh, there will be soon, she says, promises. Um, I think there, there potentially is some huge overlaps with a lot of the conditions that we know about but whether this is a result of um kind of dysfunctions to our processing rather than being um pure dyspraxia in in the way that we know of dyspraxia is this maybe a result of um our lack of for some people lack of spatial processing i know my spatial awareness is awful perhaps it's a lack of sensory motor processing um perhaps it's just that kind of cognitive slowness or that cognitive fog that's then looking like dyspraxia or dyscalculia okay thank you steph um uh next question uh, this is a good one uh i'm intrigued to know if there has been research since having covid long covid vaccines there seems to be a huge influx of diagnosis since the pandemic Okay, um, I was worried I might get this question. Um, sorry, sorry, careful responding. Um, I did have done a lot of work um, in kind of COVID spheres as well, and with long COVID, I do think that there's a crossover of symptoms. Um, I definitely do still recommend the vaccine. This is not me saying anything bad about vaccines. In a small proportion of people, um vaccines can lead to adverse effects but i don't think it causes fnd um and at least research doesn't suggest that it is the primary cause with a lot of these things when we're talking about risk factors everything's going to pose a sort of small risk um but a combination of those risks in the right time in the right place lead to those disruptions in the neural networks so i think it's um we can't really make that direct correlation um, between vaccines or COVID. There's certainly, at least in sort of the third sector, we are seeing increased rates of people coming forward since the pandemic. And in my last research study, um, I certainly had many more people saying that COVID was their trigger. Um, but I think that's the same way that other viral infections have have previously been triggers. For me, uh, glandular fever was the, the thing that triggered my symptoms at 14. Didn't see any symptoms in my childhood before then. Um, but when I developed glandular fever, it was certainly very downhill from there. Um, so I think it poses the same risk that other viral infections and known infections cause. Okay, thank you. Um, got to go on here. Uh, what is your view to recode for FND being dissociative neurological symptom disorder? Does it help identify all people and why has the higher rate parent code FND been, been removed? Uh, and what can we do to look into this? Uh, they've been told by NHS England they need to research papers to support a need for change. I think um, the terminology for FND has long been contested. I certainly still get very annoyed when I see researchers using the term conversion disorder in uh, research papers, for example. And in fact, the other day, I think I saw one that was still using the term hysteria. Um, there has always been debates over what we call FND. Um, I think I use the term FND because it's kind of the most widely accepted by, by the patient community. I'm not saying it's entirely the correct one. Um, and even though my research does focus a lot on dissociation, I think I'd be very worried if 
we start bringing in the term dissociation that people will automatically link this to psychological responses again and start going back down that trauma line of inquiry just because dissociation has been so closely studied in conditions that are a direct result of trauma so things like ptsd um, and complex ptsd so i think the name absolutely could be changed but whether that's actually going to help us um in the long run to include something around dissociation i'm not entirely sure i do think that we haven't paid enough attention to dissociation um and that we need to include that in our kind of models and our understanding um in theory but i don't know if it should be in the name somebody was asking what the um how you're going to do the um acronyms but the acronym you used in your first slide i think it was snn um, sorry, yes, so that's an AI method. It's uh, spiking neural networks. Okay, thank you. Uh, would love your recommendations on AI research and using AI techniques to understand FND. Yep, that's um, <laughs> as soon as the PhD is written, that will be the <laughs> next publication that comes out. I have it kind of nearly ready to go. Um, so for me, it's about when we do an EEG study, I cannot tell you the amount of data points um, that that generates. And it um, what we need to understand better is those patterns of connectivity. Um, and the best way to approach that is possibly with the use of AI um, to introduce mathematical modeling, uh, to understand how those connections influence, you know, can we predict the next pattern of movement? Um, so AI is certainly a really interesting line and the next line that I'm trying to go into, I think. Okay. Um, somebody lost connection at one point and asking, uh, FND cannot be seen as a brain in, in a brain scan followed by how something was seen in, in a resting state. Could you uh, go over that again, please, briefly? Uh, I mean, I imagine it is an fMRI this could be seen, and however, is there any neuro, neuroimaging used in practice? Um, so there certainly is a difference between what we do in research and what is in clinical practice. It takes an awful long time for research to influence clinical practice. Um, also, the, the research methods that we use are not the same as diagnostic tools. Um, we hope that through research we can generate diagnostic tools, but we're not at that stage quite with FND. Um, I've lumped together quite a few kind of neuroimaging methods throughout this. So I've talked about EEGs, but there's also some findings in there from PET scans, CT scans, MRI and fMRI. Um, because in order to understand uh, holistically what is happening with neural networks, I think we need to take this really combined approach um, and understand things from, from different, um, different research methods. Um, so whilst in research, I can see differences in in the, the work that I've done, that doesn't mean we're yet at a stage where someone can go to the doctor um, or the neurologist and have um, a scan and be easily identified. A lot of the time when we do research, we also do comparisons. So we take an average of the FND group, we take an average of our control groups, and we're comparing averages. Um, we're not yet at the stage where we can very successfully identify from one brain scan to the next who has what symptoms for example or who has fnd and who doesn't a lot of the work that i'm doing at the moment is in the very early stages of trying to ascertain if that's possible okay thank you now we've got a hand up from uh we've still got a few more questions in the chat but uh um uh, bernadette do you want to come in After a mute. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, would you want any question, please? Yeah, I appreciate that you can't give specific advice, but I was wondering if people could tell me if you could drive while diagnosed with functional neurological disorder. It very much depends on the symptoms. Um. So I always say this is kind of down to the individual to decide um, and depending on your symptoms. If you have functional seizures, for example, or lose consciousness, then perhaps not. Um, I have never chosen to drive. I don't think I'm a 
I, I don't think I evolved to drive um, is my first statement there. I have recently tried to um, gain more spatial awareness using an electric bike. Um, and that for me was how I'm trying to work on my spatial awareness. Not saying that's the safest thing in the world as well, particularly when I have my little one um, towing along behind me. Um, but for me, because I still have seizures, I've chosen not to drive. So I think it's very much your symptoms and how you feel and perhaps consult a doctor who's going to have more of an overview of your um, your symptoms and your illness who can advise you on that better. Great. Thank you, Steph. Um, we, we, we're going to be bringing this to a close shortly because we are about nearly up to the hour and we, we, we started late, obviously. Um, a quick question here, Sam. Do you think there's a strong link between autism, ADHD and FND? I think there's an awful lot of contemporary research about this. Um, so particularly some studies that have started in around 2022 or have been published around 2022. So they probably started a little bit earlier. Um, and there does seem to be a suggestion that there are really high rates of autism. So ASD um, and ADHD in those with FND. Now, whether that's um, that someone has a comorbidity and has both of those conditions at the same time, or whether that's a result of some FND symptoms looking um, like ASD and ADHD, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and again, I think this is an area where we need certainly more research and more understanding. It's something that we're not too clued up on yet. Well, then about the COVID vaccine. Um... Okay, I think we're about there, actually, um, given the time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just quickly scrolling down some of the ones I've not managed to see. I'm getting down to the bottom now. Um, if anyone has them, any oh, there's lots of thanks for you, Steph, and for everything you've been talking about this morning. People finding it really informative um, uh, and, uh, you know, just a really great presentation. So thank you for that. Um, I think we will bring it for an end there. And uh, once again, thanks, Steph, for a, a wonderful presentation and for answering so many questions so thoroughly. Uh, research is obviously a very um, uh, big area with FND that's increased quite a lot over the last few years. Uh, and Steph is a, certainly one of the people who, who is at the forefront of that. So it's great to have her presenting today. Um, so we're going to stop the recording now and say thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, the next session is at three o'clock this afternoon with FND Portal. We'll be looking a little bit at the history about FND um, under the, uh, the today's hashtag then and now. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone. Thanks to Steph. And we look forward to seeing you later on. Thank you. Thanks all.